my um, skirts around and in some ways um, has much to learn from, I would say, the topic of exhibitions and, and that this will become evident as um, I get going with my paper. Um, I also want to make a point of um, taking a little bit of time to thank the families um, of the artists who I will be discussing today because it's their work really and their archives are with the families um, and it will become evident why this is very important um, in terms of the argument I'm going to make. And I feel very privileged that the families of um, Frank Bowling and Sarah Jackson and Helen Phillips specifically have opened their doors to me and have shared um, their collections and their life histories um, and in many ways um, often their feelings um, and personal histories. Um, so which is always a very moving um, process that one feels very privileged to be part of as an art historian. Finally, I'd also like to think, uh, thank the Paul Mellon Center because most of this research that I'll be discussing today actually comes out of the fellowship that I did at the PMC um, in London and which um, I've not totally been able to use. Um, and so this is another reason why I'm very happy to be presenting today. Um, and it feels like the ideal um, context for uh, this research to come out. Um, so, Julia, sorry, just the one thing before you start, because there has been a request from uh, the audience, if you can raise your uh, voice just a little bit, if you can. Uh, yeah, is this better? I think for me it's better, yes. Thank you. Well, if not, you can always um, just stop me and let me know, and we can do a little bit of troubleshooting. Um, but in the meantime, writing intersectional histories that attend to the legacies of empire means moving through institutional archives imaginatively and perhaps with a degree of irreverence. We know that archives are, to use the terms of Jacques Derrida, sites of death and amnesia where complex social and cultural dynamics are systematically amended, reified, flattened and erased. We know too from Sadia Hartman and other post-colonial thinkers, too many to mention, that institutional archives make for unreliable yet powerful witnesses whose claims to the truth require rigorous unsettling and to cite the work of Arela Azoulay, unlearning. So with this in mind, and given the focus of this conference on identity and exhibition histories, I would want to ask, how does the study of national exhibitions and collecting practices aid the project of reorienting the discipline of our history to the more just and ultimately more nuanced interpretations of the past? When unequal patterns of inclusion within the art historical canon have been shaped by the acquisition practices of museums and research institutions wedded to national agendas, can intersectionality be successfully cultivated within the analytical and archival framework of the nation state? In a time of rampant nationalisms, and I'm speaking um, from Britain and beyond it, should we not seek testimonies that put pressure on the logic of national belonging in order to emphasize the idiosyncratic nature of artistic production and of national cultures more broadly? In other words, should we not seek to unlearn national histories? I begin with these methodological questions. I begin with these methodological questions because they underpin my thinking with regards to what I perceive as the limitations of art historical scholarship that prioritizes high profile institutional networks, events and archives over the affective lives of artists and their works. Mine is not a reductive collapse into the biographical for the sake of aggrandizing the all too familiar figure of the artist genius, certainly not to the detriment of other contextual factors at play in the making of artistic meaning. Rather, mine is a strategic call to revisit the boundaries, content, and meaning of art made across the 20th century, and specifically in the aftermath of the Second World War, as a significant period when the preferential circulation 
of teleological narratives about the rise of national styles and schools played a key role in marginalizing what was in fact an extraordinarily vibrant multiplicity of artistic networks and idioms intermingling across national borders. So thinking specifically about the British context with which I am most familiar, this rich tapestry of identities and contact zones does not remotely come alive for me or even appear often inside the archives of patriotic and epoch defining displays, such as for example, the Festival of Britain of 1951 about which much has been written or the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennial of 1952. And here I wonder if some of you, maybe Claudia will disagree with me more for the Q&A. Absent from these exhibition, um, sorry, absent from these exhibition histories and their associated discourses about the remaking of national identity in the context of the global decline of the British Empire is any tangible, um, any tangible sense of the fact that the post-war period was characterized in Britain by remarkably cosmopolitan social and artistic geographies. As emphasized by a recent spate of revisionist texts and exhibitions, in the middle decades of the 20th century, Britain and London in particular, but the nation at large, was seen internationally as a safe haven and a place of cultural and political refuge, becoming a crossroads for the meeting of diasporic cultures and subjectivities. So last year, for example, this politically meaningful narrative about the idiosyncrasies of modern British society and culture was foregrounded in the Barbican exhibition, Post-War Modern, New Art in Britain, 1945 to 1965, whose remarkable success depended precisely on the curatorial team's choice to move away from an established cast of characters and narratives about the nation in order to turn instead towards the realm of embodied and effective intimacies as a way of remapping the playing field along post-colonial and intersectional lines. This led to the spotlighting of previously undervalued artists and archives, including, for example, that of the Welsh painter Sylvia Slay, whose highly entertaining and very moving romantic correspondence with the younger art critic Lawrence Alloway was used to contextualize a number of works, including this extraordinarily lavish and thoroughly irreverent for the time, in fact, it couldn't really be shown at the time, portrait of the young critic in bridal drag. Equally, audiences across the board welcomed the inclusion of Jean Cook, whose pictorial records of the horrendous psychological and physical abuse she suffered at the hands of her husband, John Bradby, offered harsh insights into the domestic scenes associated with Bradby's success as a prominent member of the so-called kitchen sink school of British realist painting. So I cite these examples because they point to how romantic, or at least for me, they point to how romantic and effective relationships can shed light on histories of post-war art that are not only more inclusive than previously acknowledged, but which matter a great deal in establishing the continued relevance and potency of this art historical period. This is an argument that I developed more fully in an article on the early figurative paintings of the, of the British Guyanese artist Frank Bowling, which, as you can see, take reproduction, childbirth, and other sexual and libidinal entanglements as their primary subject matter. As is often remarked in the literature on this painter, his trajectory was emblematic of a wider trend whereby artists alighting from different parts of the Commonwealth and specifically from the Caribbean received initial exposure and support in post-war London. But, but by the beginning of the 1960s, already felt pressed to seek opportunities elsewhere after being excluded from a string of major institutional shows that went on to define the discourse around mid 20th century British art. The socio-historical significance of these arguably racialized exclusions partly explains why scholarship on bowling tends to prioritize the institutional setting for the production and circulation of his early artworks over their central and affective qualities. 
although these are clearly and manifestly their chief subject matter. This is especially unfortunate as these very qualities, which are textural as well as iconographic, hold key anti-racist insights and imaginaries that put into serious crisis the meaning of nation and national belonging for this period. On this point, it is worth bearing in mind that the works in question emerged against the backdrop of rising nativist anxieties about the growing visibility of interracial unions in 1960s Britain, at a point in time where the rhetoric around the association between whiteness and Englishness was sharpening its teeth. As Stuart Hall recalled in, in, in his autobiography, miscegenation came to be the overdetermined element in this pattern of thought, invoking all the structures of feeling in which the racial taint worked as a kind of contagion, as bad blood, passed on in the making of mixed race children. Graphically explored in paintings like abortion and afternoon nap, these themes come to a head in a subtler fashion inside Mirror, a monumental canvas that I want to offer as a template for a method of inquiry centered on the study of what I call diasporic intimacies. Mirror is a psychologically and compositionally dense scene that signals at once Bowling's disillusionment with the British art world and the breakdown of his marriage with the English author Paddy Kitchen. Others before me have examined in detail the mosaic of stylistic references that make up this domestic interior as a tongue-in-cheek parody of the various movements that dominated the institutional discourse about British modernism at this time. So briefly, bowling blended elements of op art inspired by Victor Vasily, British pop a la Richard Hamilton, along with a series of recognizable citations of Francis Bacon's existentialist approach to figuration, um, along with other references. And in so doing, he essentially demonstrated that he was able to pander to the aesthetics favored by the institutional British art world, whilst also making a point about his exclusion from a cultural milieu an economy that by this point he fully understood as being biased along ethno-nationalist lines. So this has led Leon Wainwright to describe Mirror as a self-portrait of Bowling's marginality, an incisive summary that takes into account the fact that the artist features not once but twice in the composition. First, as the devil's character hanging in the top right, and then again as the evanescent presence at the bottom of the spiraling staircase around which the whole scene pivots. But moving beyond this interpretation, which tells us again about dominant styles and national histories and national, national champions, Mirror is also an emotionally complex com commentary on the challenges of sustaining a polyamorous relationship that was also a mixed race union forged in the context of the cosmopolitan and sexually liberated aspirations of the mid 20th century. The third and least discussed figure in the painting is indeed Kitchen, Bowling's first wife, from whom he was in the process of separating, who with her husband is seen descending the steps that connected the painting studios of the Royal College of Art, where Bowling studied, with the V&A galleries. Like everything else in this scene, this setting is highly symbolic, representing at once Bowling's crushed dreams of institutional ascent and his turbulent relationship with the art school from which he was temporarily kicked out following his marriage to Kitchen, who at the time worked as a registrar and assistant to Robert Darwin, the school's principal. Having received word of the union, Darwin proceeded to expel bowling on the pretext that romantic liaisons between staff and students were prohibited, a rule that by all accounts he fabricated in order to justify a decision that bowling immediately understood as being racially motivated. Particularly grating for Darwin and his colleagues were the artists perceived infidelities, even though these indiscretions were part and parcel of the open arrangement that he and Kitchen shared. 
On this point, it is worth noting that Kitchen was one of the women interviewed for the seminal feminist anthology, Talking to Women, published in 1965, in which she discussed the benefits as well as the complications of what in today's terminology we would call an open marriage. Our society, she complained, just hasn't got to the stage where intimate relationships can just be accepted. And this she described as an enormous social problem. Unconventional in more than one respect, her union with Bowling situates his paintings from the early 1960s as part of, as part of an unfolding and crucially not one-sided renegotiation of sexual and social norms. So revisiting these works in terms of the politics of the erotic and the affective allows for a deeper understanding of how they participated in a critical renegotiation of personal and collective freedoms at a time when outward expressions of black sexuality and the representation of interracial relationships, let alone polyamorous ones, constituted tangible threats to the British establishment. But beyond this, privileging the field of the diasporic intimacies, not merely as a subject of iconographic inquiry, but as an analytical framework, has the benefit of opening up uncharted historiographic pathways that allow for intersectional relationships, images, and feelings to come to the fore. This might mean, for example, connecting bowling with Kitchen and with other female artists, forgotten female artists, really, I should say, including, for example, the London-based photographer Tina Tranter, author of this fascinating, um, undoubtedly problematic collection of interracial love scenes called The Lovers, published in 1971 who in 1968 also collaborated with Bowling on a documentary about his native Guyanese environs. These relational networks, I want to suggest, map out lived cultural landscapes that allow us to move beyond the politics of identity understood in a simplistic sense, disclosing highly textured and even transgressive, if often tense and painful, interactions that far exceed the ideological framework of ethno-national exhibitions, pedagogies, and collecting practices. Crucially, moreover, to recover a sense of these affective and romantic liaisons means recovering and recentering the work of female authors who often operated in the role of partners of more visible male personalities and whose archives are nowhere to be tracked within the large institutions um, that hold together many of the histories associated with post-war art in Britain and the post-war period at large. The fact that many of these women operated in relation or in the shadow of uh, other more visible male figures is particularly true um, in this context of mid 20th century gender relations as a moment that has often been seen um, as a dormant hiatus um, within a longer history of feminism, leading prominent art historians to dismiss the contribution of women artists to this period altogether. Hence, in the introduction to Experiment in Modern Realism, Alex Potts has argued that the book's overriding focus on male artists was determined by, in his words, the constitution of the art world in the mid 20th century and its very masculinist gender politics. This is a statement that a different approach to archives, one that it's more focused on individuals, family legacies, and unseen evidence, really puts into question in my experience. In a similarly influential account, Hal Foster, Hal Foster justified the absence of female artists um, in his book, The First Pop Age, by contending that, quote, women could not act as its principal subjects of pop art in large part because they were conscripted as its primary objects, even its primary fetishes, meaning that they could have no part, no agency within this field of pop art because they were really the object of desire represented on canvas, which left no space for their subjectivity. And although this claim clearly speaks to the visual economy 
uh, of many works associated with British pop art, um, epitomized here by Richard Hamilton's painting, She, although I could have chosen many other examples. For me, it also betrays the analytical limitations of a teleological model of criticism and inquire, inquiry, rather should say, dependent upon a conception of modernist aesthetics founded on the primacy of recognizable styles, schools, and movements associated with nation, national identity making. As soon as we replace categories like British pop with looser and more speculative concepts like diasporic intimacies, we open up the art historical field to socially meaningful interpretations that throw into question reductive conceptions of art historical value premised upon social as well as sexual cachet. Perhaps well suited to testing this theory is the example of This Is Tomorrow, a canon making exhibition that opened in the summer of 1956 at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, and that went on to define the look of mid 20th century British modernism. It may even be said that it's the most famous exhibition associated um, with the formation of a, a post-war British identity in the 1950s. Although 10 teams have participated in the show, each presenting a collaboration between an architect, a sculptor, and a visual artist, the event came down in history for the two installations of the independent group, which were associated early on with the emergence of brutalism and pop art. So this is a familiar narrative with roots in the initial reception of This Is Tomorrow and pervasive ramifications in the secondary literature. Really very little work has been done to try to move beyond these um, um, archival roots. That subsequent historians have insistently focused on the same cast of characters encompassing Richard Hamilton, John McHale, Eduardo Palozzi, Nigel Henderson, and the architect duo of Peter and Alison Smithson underscores the lack of genuinely original research on This Is Tomorrow, as well as on the period at large, outside of national institutions whose archives are heavily skewed towards the representation of male artists born in the United Kingdom. Yet as many as three women participated in the show as contributing artists, Helen Phillips from California, Sarah Jackson, born in Detroit as the daughter of Jewish Polish immigrants, and the English constructionist sculptor, Mary Martin, who today is the more well-known name in association with her husband and frequent collaborator, Kenneth Martin. Not officially included in the exhibition, but involved in its making was Magda Cordell, the Jewish Hungarian refugee who at the time was at the center of a love triangle with the English composer Frank Cordell and the Scottish visual artist, John McHale, both of whom had in different forms contributed to the so-called pop pavilion at This Is Tomorrow, and whose intimate liaisons are yet to be explored in relation to the forms of erotic agency at play in the exuberantly visceral aesthetic of Cordell's paintings. Formerly Magda Lustigova, she had met Frank Cordell as a Jewish refugee living in Palestine, and with him had come to London, where eventually both had become involved with the independent group. Frustratingly, however, Cordell's idiosyncratic background and aesthetic vision placed her mostly out of sight in the voluminous literature on the group. And for me, this is a real shame as her paintings, whose subjects she repeatedly compared to organs in the process of transplantation, offer a powerful symbolic narrative for a period marked by diasporic and often traumatic patterns of migration that saw the desiring body become a vehicle of healing and belonging. Different forms of mobility compared to Magda Cordell were enjoyed by Sarah Jackson and Helen Phillips, two American artists who had traveled substantially with the support of state-sponsored scholarships before marrying respectively the English designer and architectural theorist, Anthony Jackson, and the English painter and printmaker, Stanley William Heiser. And yet they too fell by the wayside in the secondary literature. Philip's case is particularly regrettable given the quality and range of his sculptural and printed output. 
not to mention the visibility she enjoyed in her lifetime, something that is nowhere reflected in the institutional archives of the three countries where the artist spent the most significant and most prolific parts of her career, namely the United States, England and France. If these gaps in the official record point to the gendered constitution of the mid 20th century art world, as Potts and Foster would have it, they also speak of the challenges involved in incorporating the legacies and bequests of artists who in the lifetime were highly mobile within the logic, um, sorry, of incorporating the legacies and bequests of artists who in their lifetime were highly mobile within the logic of national art histories and collections. So these are all pictures taken um in Helen Phillips home um by me and therefore they're not fantastic and I apologize for that it is telling in this respect that Tate Britain owns multiple artworks of limited national significance in my opinion by Phillips husband William Stanley Heiter while important sculptures made by Phillips for display in the United Kingdom are kept remain I guess in the private home of one of her descendants where they remain understudied and under acknowledged by the wider scholarly community. So this begs the question of what does nationhood mean within these collecting practices and how has it changed or should change over time? Among the pieces that um, I, I saw when I visited um, Helen Phillips, um, descendant and estate keeper, is the sculptural maquette that in 1951, won Phillips the first prize for the French contribution to the unknown political prisoner, a national sculpture competition organized by the ICA in London and now recognized as a landmark event in the history of post-war modernism. Hence, you would expect this object to live a more public life. In her later years, Phillips acknowledged that her reputation had suffered from what she called a lack of geographical focus. I never wanted to be the best sculptor in France, the best sculptor in America. I never wanted to be that because I don't believe in it. I don't think it's that limited. She stated in an interview with art critic David Cohen, adding, I like to be part of something. It was important for me to do it, to make it. And then she goes, for a quarter of a century, I lived with a man for whom it was a necessity to be center stage. My main focus was making something. So in these statements, the idea of success, of making it in the transnational art world is equated to the act of making, of creating sculptures. And crucially, both goals are presented as having been hindered by a marriage with a more visible male artist who acted by turns as her most reliable champion and her most challenging obstacle. And it is this uneasy dynamic, finally, that I choose to read into Philip's submission for This Is Tomorrow. Realized at the invitation of the architect Erno Goldfinger, himself a Hungarian Jew who had moved to Western Europe in the 1920s following the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the original sculpture was made in balsa wood and its abstract configuration conjured two entangled bodies in the process of wrestling each other. Being relatively lightweight, the piece was shown hanging from a thread, a choice designed to present the piece in constant motion, and which for me elevates it to a fitting symbol of the relational and unstable nature of identity, as I have been defining it throughout this paper. It is certainly remarkable that surviving documentation of this now lost culture features Phillips posing with it in a ribbed dress that echoes the sutures of the balsa wood further suggesting that the artwork acted as a kind of self-portrait or double for the artist. A replica, cast in metal, was later produced as a token of friendship and gratitude for the collection of Erno Goldfinger and his wife Ursula, herself an artist and keen admirer of surrealist art. Their modernist house at Two Willow Road in Hampstead remains a testament to the importance that marital and romantic relationships played in shaping circuits of art production and appreciation in post-war London, often providing a viable, if undoubtedly fraught, avenue of expression for talented women 
artists and collectors. Sorry, Julia, just to let you know, two minutes more. No, I'm finished. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm just going to repeat that sentence because it sounds like I have time. Their modernist house at Two Willow Road in Hampstead remains a testament to the importance that marital and romantic relationships played in shaping circuits of art production and appreciation in post-war London, often providing a viable, if undoubtedly fraught, avenue of expression for talented women artists and collectors. Today, Two Willow Road is managed by the National Trust. And this situates not only this residence, but domestic and conjugal settings in a broader sense, at the heart of the nation's heritage and culture. Understood as dynamic sites of negotiation between different identities often engaged in unequal power relations. These intimate settings are precisely where a more intersectional, diasporic and more faithful history of the nation might be reimagined. Thank you. <laughs>